Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be joining us. My name is Peter Arvo, and I will be your guide during the Torchbearer series. This is course B501, Suppressed Bible Manuscript History, and we're in session 3 of 3. If you missed session 1 or 2, it's highly recommended to view those before continuing, since we will build upon those prior two sessions and there will be very little review. To view or download the first two sessions for free, please visit www.thetorchbearerseries.com. In the first two sessions, we provided proof that not all Bibles are based upon the same Hebrew and Greek text, and which Bible we believe is the one to use and why. We also provided evidence for the importance of b raid and Umcoke. In this session, we will provide information to assist the individual in restoring the pure Christian doctrine of the Apostles as revealed by the Waldenses, Elbogenses, Linus, Cathari, Puritans, Piffles, Paterines, Lollards, Valdensian Christians, and more. If possible, visit the website to obtain the most recent version of this lecture and related documents. Just as in the previous two sessions, before we begin it will be useful to reflect upon the following important quotes. The first quote is, quote, The largest impediment to discovering truth is the belief you already have it, end quote. Although the origin of this quote is unknown, it's definitely profoundly true. The second quote is, These, meaning the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. The Book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 11. The third quote is, He is like a man which built a house, and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Luke chapter 6 verse 48 and our last quote is if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do psalms chapter 11 verse 3 without a strong foundation a person's faith and trust can be destroyed but as we have demonstrated in the previous two sessions you can have a strong solid stable foundation this session will now reinforce that foundation by clarifying the holy perimeter that your house of faith rests upon. This course is broken up into seven main sections. 1. The Seven Golden Rules of Bible Interpretation. 2. Christian Torchbearer Doctrines, the Basic Beliefs. 3. Justification, Soteriology, Salvation through Diplomatic Status. 4. Sanctification, holiness for inheritance, rewards, and crowns. 5. Glorification, God's ultimate love. 6. Two wines, understanding the hidden biblical importance. 7. The Sabbath, end of the bride and bridegroom mystery, plus some bonus charts at the end. As a reminder to those new to this series or who have forgotten, that besides the references presented in this audio-video lecture series, additional references are available in the supplemental lecture notes for these sessions. Also, many of the charts and diagrams shown in this lecture series are available as separate PDF and JPEG files, which you can use for your own purposes per the copyright license agreement located at the torchbearerseries.com website. We will first start with the correct Bible interpretation methods using the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation. But before we get into this section, it would be useful to review the difference between the holiness of man as compared to the holiness of God, as shown in the chart called Man vs. God Holiness Chart. We will briefly go through the chart without reading the Bible verses, which you can do on your own if you like. Going from left to right on the chart, Man has unholy attributes, God has holy attributes. Man speaks lies, God speaks truth. Man is wicked, God is good. Man is flawed, God is perfect. Man deceives himself, God is all-knowing. Man is unfaithful, God is faithful. After reviewing this chart, who do you trust? 
man or god hermeneutics is the science of interpretation especially of the scriptures namely the methods and principles used for interpretation in this case we are using the seven golden rules of bible interpretation which is a modern rendition distilled from the knowledge obtained and discerned from the torchbearers these seven rules were first published in 2019 as part of this lecture series there are two primary methods for studying hermeneutics the actual explanation or interpretation of the biblical text based upon evidence is called exegesis while eisegesis is based upon a subjective process making the text mean anything that one wants it to mean the seven golden rules of bible interpretation follows a strict exegesis process which we trust that the ancient torchbearers would have used the same criteria and methods to understand the bible correctly we will also be excluding the genre principle which is often misapplied and offers nothing to better comprehend the biblical text the idea behind the genre principle is to group the different books of the bible into categories so as to determine what each book of the bible has to offer which is entirely subjective for example the book of psalms is often placed in the genre category of poetry versus the prophecy genre however psalms contains many prophecies of christ's birth life ministry death and resurrection that are too numerous to list here therefore it is a book of poetry as well as prophecy all the books of the bible can fall into multiple genres which have spawned numerous genre lists that many scholars call by different names the genre principle if considered at all should only be considered as a very basic guide the first rule rule of inspired text only use inspired text to study and understand the bible anything less is not scripture second timothy chapter three verse sixteen in english god's inspired text can be found in the form of the authorized king james bible which was translated by forty-seven of the world's best and most faithful translators who obtained and used the pure hebrew and greek text this text was transmitted through an unbroken chain of custody from diverse groups throughout europe like the waldenses known collectively as the early christian torchbearers god's supernaturally inspired text can only be spiritually discerned by a believer and god promised to preserve his word and did note we specifically recommend the authorized King James Bible Cambridge type of 1920 A.D. or newer. The second rule, rule of literal interpretation. Take every word or phrase as its primary, usual dictionary meaning from the historical time period in which it was written, except if the facts of the immediate context indicate a deeper, hidden, or symbolic meaning when studied in light of related passages and fundamental truths. This literal interpretation is not to be confused with legitimate known figures of speech in the Bible such as metaphors, similes, parables, allegories, etc. An example of a metaphor is Proverbs chapter 13 verse 14, quote, The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death, end quote. The third rule, rule of context words and phrases must be taken within the context of its verse adjoining verses in the context of the entire passage radiating outward the exception to this rule is that many prophetic verses are only unlocked and comprehended by locating its corresponding key located elsewhere within the entire bible for example the fiery brass serpent set upon a pole in numbers chapter twenty one verses eight through nine is explained by john chapter three verses fourteen through fifteen the fourth rule rule of first mention often the first mention of a word can define what that word means for the rest of the bible it is important to remember that this is not always the case especially for words that have more than one meaning for example, 
Genesis chapter 1 verses 3 through 5 defines the word light, which has a primary meaning of illumination and several secondary meanings, including the definition of that which is good. Another example of this is the first mention of wine in the Bible that is found in Genesis chapter 9 verse 21. And since wine has more than one primary meaning, as defined in several old dictionaries, such as the Royal Dictionary by Abel Boyer, 1702, we can't use the rule of first mention in this case. The rule of first mention also often sets forth the first instance of a prophetic pattern to take place. For examples of this, see the end of the Bride and Bridegroom Mystery Document and the end of the Bride and Bridegroom Mystery Chart from the Torchbearer series. The fifth rule, rule of non-contradiction, no part of the Bible may be interpreted so as to contradict another part because it is a tightly integrated information system with each book interconnecting and authenticating another book. Nor can any part contradict God's perfect holy character. To test your understanding, replace every instance of a word or phrase in the entire Bible with what you believe it means, and it should result in perfect comprehension without contradicting anything. If not, then you must reevaluate your understanding of the word or phrase. This process will typically yield additional details to the word or phrase. Perceived contradictions and misunderstandings can also occur when a single event is perceived as different multiple events, or similarities between multiple events are perceived to be a single event. For example, one event or two, Luke chapter 21, before these, Matthew chapter 24, then, one event or two, Matthew chapter 20 verses 29 through 34, two blind men and two Jerichos, Mark chapter 10 verses 46 through 52, Luke chapter 18 verses 35 through 43, one blind man and one Jericho. The sixth rule, rule of culture. The Bible was originally written by specific cultures, mostly Jewish, at particular periods in the past. The pure Hebrew and Greek texts were then translated into English by 47 King James translators and completed in 1611 AD. The meaning of various words, phrases, stories, customs, and festivals cannot be fully comprehended without prior knowledge of the culture. If a dictionary is used, it necessitates a dictionary dating closer to the King James time period and using a good source for ancient Jewish traditions and customs. Keep in mind that the best and most authoritative source to fully apprehend words and phrases from the Bible is by using the Bible itself. For example, first fruits is mentioned in Exodus chapter 23 verse 19 as part of Jewish custom and a yearly festival, which directly relates to Jesus as the first fruits and who is raised during first fruits in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20. The seventh rule, rule of single interpretation. Every verse in the Bible has only one single interpretation, although that verse may have multiple applications. No single interpretation can be held valid without the validation of another person, since no scripture is of private interpretation. See 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. And as such, it is strongly recommended no Bible translated by a single person should ever be used. This rule, however, does not imply that a correct Bible interpretation should be determined by a majority vote. Many may recommend using a resource like JewishEncyclopedia.com, originally assembled in 1909, for the purpose of reading about Jewish traditions and customs, but we personally recommend against this. Certain parts are not accurate, and there isn't time or space here to go through specific examples of this. Christ warned about some of the man-made traditions of the Pharisees, See Mark chapter 7 verses 3 through 9 and also the Jewish drift chart. 
just as the early torchbearer christians warned others when rome started to merge paganism with the christian faith and created new non-christian traditions based upon half-truths we feel that a better resource for jewish traditions is to use the book called dr william smith's dictionary of the bible in nine volumes which is available for free from www.archive.org it is always wise to test all things to see if they are true and to that degree we will later put two of the more controversial doctrines presented in this lecture to the test with you by using all seven golden rules of bible interpretation we provided this chart in session one but it is worth showing this chart again to see a glimpse of how many interconnected cross-referencing instances occur within the bible the following is a non-exhaustive list of christian torchbearer doctrines backed up by bible verses we advise each person to diligently study the word of god while using the seven golden rules of bible interpretation to decide for themselves if these things are true for those who don't know the word torah listed later in this section is the technical name for the first five books of the old testament written by moses number one there is only one god number two god is a trinity number three god jesus created everything including angels number four jesus is god number five jesus has two natures divine and human number six jesus was sinless number seven jesus is the only way to god the father number eight jesus will be the final judge number nine jesus's true church is not made of brick and mortar number ten the holy ghost is god number eleven the holy ghost is not merely a force he is alive number twelve all people have sinned number thirteen man did not evolve he was created by god number fourteen through one man came all nations and races number fifteen adam and eve were real people number sixteen jesus confirms genesis as real tangible history number seventeen jesus confirms moses wrote the torah and moses wrote of him number eighteen moses confirms six twenty-four hour days of creation as a side note the big bang theory is not compatible with genesis and is an attempt to explain creation without intelligent design first nothing existed and then nothing exploded the big bang theory injects billions of years and has the sun existing before the earth but the bible says the earth and plants were first and then the sun was created so the chronologies timelines are not compatible see the big bang theory verse bible timeline chart depicted here in addition until adam and eve sinned there was no death in the world since death is the punishment for sin not having death until the fall of adam and eve is incompatible with the two entwined theories of the big bang theory and the evolution theory number nineteen death entered the world because of and after adam's sin darwin's theory of evolution is not compatible with the biblical account of a single real first man married to a single real first woman created by god evolution theory is not to be confused with the recognized natural selection process number twenty sin separates us from god number twenty one jesus died in our place for all our sins number twenty two jesus's physical body rose from the dead number twenty three the least sin results in separation from god which is why we need christ number twenty four those who reject jesus will not enter heaven but hell number twenty five 
willful unrepentant disobeyers of god's laws will not enter the kingdom of heaven number twenty six the bible is the inspired and preserved word of god number twenty seven satan rules as prince and god of this world until lord jesus christ returns number twenty eight angelic warfare can affect the outcome of physical events number twenty nine a rapture event being caught up in the clouds with jesus will occur number thirty jesus will physically return and reign from a temple for a thousand years number thirty one there will be a new heaven and a new earth there are many more items which could have been added to the previous list but for the sake of simplicity and not including certain doctrines we have not confirmed or covered yet they are not included here we recommend seeking out and studying scripture for yourself using the seven golden rules of bible interpretation Quote, study to show thyself approved unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth End quote. second timothy chapter two verse fifteen for anyone who would like tangible evidence for the reality of moses and the events surrounding moses please see the documentaries called patterns of evidence the exodus and the second documentary called patterns of evidence the moses controversy salvation the first in a three-step process we will refer to the three stages of salvation chart and the following three christian theological terms for the next three sections which are often confusing to many people but we will always include simple to understand terminology we will quickly review justification sanctification and glorification and then we will go through each one of these in more detail first justification a term used to refer to jesus paying for your sins so you do not have to suffer eternal punishment and instead can enter heaven after death think of justification as your spiritual diplomatic passport what's required your faith and acceptance that lord jesus christ paid for your crimes sins against god and repentance of your sins repentance means to wholeheartedly ask god for forgiveness the result you become god's diplomat second sanctification a term that refers to the process of becoming more holy like lord jesus christ in order to earn and or keep your inheritance rewards and crowns what's required become more like lord jesus christ in your thoughts and actions and diligently represent and promote god's ways truthfully and accurately as his diplomat also thought of as his representative the result you are god's diplomat third glorification a term used to denote the glorious result after death your inheritance rewards and crowns are provided to you what's required justification is required and then your level of sanctification will determine the level of your glorification the result you retire to heaven with god after your diplomatic duties the first step in salvation is often referred to as justification we are saved from god's wrath and justice for the crimes we have committed against him and others as previously mentioned your faith and acceptance that lord jesus christ paid for your crimes sins against god and repentance for your sins gains you your spiritual diplomatic passport to enter heaven it should be noted that physical baptism is not a requirement for the justification process since if it were required then obtaining entrance into heaven would be based upon works your deeds instead of on faith alone this however does not mean you should not get baptized justification is a short and immediate event based purely on your faith it separates you from the penalty of sin and provides you with diplomatic status and diplomatic immunity from god's laws so long as you don't continue to intentionally commit sin and or believe you are above god's laws 
the following is a short list of what you obtain after you repent and commit to accept by faith the offer from lord jesus christ that he paid for your sins one you become god's diplomat and gain responsibilities two the record of all your previous violations against god's laws is blotted out and permanently erased three you gain diplomatic immunity against unintentionally breaking god's laws four you obtain a spiritual passport to heaven five any supernatural force that seeks to come against you must now have prior approval from god see the book of job in the bible and also first corinthians three sixteen six god's holy ghost now resides with you and will give you the power to overcome sin in your life seven you have the opportunity to keep and increase your heavenly inheritance rewards and crowns grace and law the law moves from being only written text to being written on the hearts of those who are god's people similarities between diplomats and god's followers many know in today's modern world that if a person represents their home country in a temporary host country or kingdom that person is called a diplomat and is given diplomatic immunity in that temporary host country diplomatic immunity is provided to diplomats in case they accidentally break the law which prevents a diplomat from being put on trial convicted or jailed for the crimes committed diplomatic immunity is not an open license to violate laws nor does it eliminate the existence of the laws themselves the laws of the temporary host country are still very much in effect and the diplomats are expected to do their best to adhere to them if a diplomat were to repeatedly and intentionally break the laws of the temporary host country the diplomat could be kicked out of the country or kingdom or have their diplomatic immunity revoked likewise through god's grace god has provided his loyal followers diplomatic immunity to god's laws through christ while they are on earth representing him but this does not destroy or eliminate god's laws it only removes the punishment of accidental transgression against the laws the requirements to adhere to god's laws are still very much in effect including all ten laws that were written in stone twice by god's own hand see deuteronomy chapter ten verses one through four the regional laws created for certain time periods by the jewish leaders are the laws that are not permanent the punishment under god's laws is what was nailed to the cross as spoken of in the bible not the laws themselves Quote, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross End quote. colossians chapter two verse fourteen if the laws were done away with then murder and everything else would be permissible by god the bible states that if a person willfully continues to break god's laws and sin and doesn't honestly and wholeheartedly repent that the sacrifice on the cross will no longer cover them from punishment since it is a rejection of the sacrifice made on the cross Quote, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins End quote. hebrews chapter ten verse twenty six in short you are now a diplomat for god on earth with a clean slate and new responsibilities with your new status you have diplomatic immunity against accidental transgressions against god's laws which is not to be abused or it will be revoked it is not the goal of this next section to discuss every aspect of sanctification instead the purpose is to provide a greater general understanding sanctification step two to sanctify means to make holy set apart as sacred or to consecrate when we speak of sanctification or becoming more holy and following jesus's ways more closely we soon discover there are two main christian groups in the world with different priorities 
nominal Christians, nominal diplomats, versus dedicated Christians, dedicated diplomats. A nominal Christian is defined as a Christian who does the minimum they think is required to keep their diplomatic immunity status and enter heaven. Most nominal Christians are not aware that they will suffer the loss of heavenly inheritance, rewards, and crowns as a result. See the Crowns, Rewards, Inheritance chart. They are basically a Christian in name alone. Nominal Christians fall into two subcategories. One, those who have weak faith and are thus uncommitted. And two, those who proclaim they can do anything they want after being saved. Those in the second subcategory can be led to think that they are above God's laws, or that it doesn't matter what they do since they believe it will all just work out in the end, which can put their salvation at risk. See Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. Also see Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12, which reads, quote, That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. End quote. A dedicated Christian, also known as a disciple or metakoi, is defined as a Christian who is not just interested in obtaining access to heaven, but instead is committed to true discipleship with God and is dedicated to learning to love God and His ways. They pursue to align themselves with the first and greatest of all of God's commandments. Quote, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. End quote. Mark chapter 12 verse 30. In this pursuit, they find themselves drawn more to follow God's commandments and his ways out of love and dedication. Quote, if ye love me, keep my commandments. End quote. John chapter 14 verse 15 quote, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. End quote. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 this crowns rewards inheritance chart represents what you may obtain or lose depending on your belief faith and service to god unprofitable servants to god will suffer loss see the chart and read matthew 22 salvation versus discipleship salvation is for those who believe and put their faith in jesus even for the nominal christian discipleship is for believers willing to pay the price suffer a christian disciple sometimes called a metakoi is a person who is a learner a pupil an apprentice or an adherent to the doctrines of lord jesus christ who attaches himself to his teacher even at great personal cost Quote, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. end quote. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 To the best of our knowledge, partakers is the English word derived from the biblical Greek Koine Greek word metakoi in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14, which can mean one who shares in, a companion or comrade, or a partner in work, office, or dignity. Metakoi is mentioned in reference to the Waldensian torchbearers in a book called The History of the Evangelical Churches of the Valleys of Piemont by Sir Samuel Moreland, 1658. What is your calling? Once you understand sanctification, you should think hard about what your calling is. What has God called you to do for Him? This can often be discovered by looking at your past and see what knowledge you have or experiences you had, and how those things shaped you to best serve God. It could be anything from donating and supporting other fellow workers and servants of God beyond what others can do, applying a skill you have obtained in the service of God, or you may have had unique hardships that could be shared with others to strengthen their faith or encourage them to find their way to God. Dedication. If God asked you to give up your ways for His, would you? See Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 through 3. 
and chapter 4, verse 24. If God asked you to give up riches, would you? See Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. Are you willing to suffer over a long time period and give up your life to remain loyal to his ways? See Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 24. The apostles willingly did these things, as did countless metakoi, who are the torchbearers of truth. Pursuit of Holiness We are to pursue sanctification, become more holy. God is being quoted in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, quote, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy, end quote. Paul in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 verses 11 through 14 tells people to progress in their biblical understanding. Not doing anything for God after you are a believer and saved is a form of apostasy. Apostasy is defined by Dictionary.com as a total desertion of or departure from one's religion, principles, party, cause, etc. In Matthew chapter 25 verse 30 we read, quote, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, end quote. Matthew 25.30 is part of the Parable of the Talents of Silver, where additional details can also be located. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 11 we read that crowns also seem to be among the potential losses. God is light. See 1 John chapter 1 verse 5, and it says that they are cast into the outer darkness. This means that those Christian diplomats who did nothing to benefit God or promote his ways but were able to, were cast into an area far from God. Ignorance and Willful Ignorance Sin committed in ignorance could be paid for by making atonement to God. See Numbers chapter 15 verses 28 through 30. But ignorance cannot be claimed as an excuse any longer once you have the truth. See Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. In other words, ignorance becomes willful ignorance when it is premeditated, often through pride, stubbornness, or in a self-willed way. A right thing in a wrong way. You can have the right motive, but carry it out in a wrong way. God wants things done His way for the right reasons. We should not presume that we can do things according to what we think is right. If God had allowed the following things to occur without punishment, it would have set a bad precedent for others to follow. Cain's wrong sacrifice led to Abel's death and Cain's banishment. See Genesis chapter 4 verses 3 through 16. King Uzziah offered incense in the temple and was struck with leprosy. See Second Chronicles chapter 26 verses 16 through 21. Moses strikes a rock and does not enter the promised land. See Numbers chapter 20 verse 11 and also Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 5 through 52. Yuzah touches the ark to save it, resulting in his death. See 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verses 9 through 10. A man gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day, and God ordered his death. See Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36. Another way of thinking of this is from an anonymous source, quote, It is not sufficient to do a right thing in a wrong way, nor a wrong thing in a right way but only a right thing in a right way." End quote. We will illustrate this with the modern bride and groom parable. A groom asked his bride if she still had his written request in permanent ink for his special day. After checking, she replied that she did. She told him she didn't understand why his only request was to simply remember his special day and to spend the day with him as his gift, but she readily agreed. Time went by, and the special day arrived and passed without a word from the bride to her groom. The next day, the bride handed her groom a boxed gift that was wrapped with a bow. The groom, in shock, asked if she had lost his written request. The bride replied, I still have your request, but you love me so much I decided to celebrate your special day on a day that I thought was better. 
open your gift. The groom, both surprised and hurt that she would not love him enough to regard his simple request, slowly opened the gift. Surprise! she exclaimed. It's a traditional purse. When I saw it, I just knew that you would really love it, because I love it. Anyway, it's a thought that counts, right? The groom stared at the traditional purse, at a loss for words, with tears in his eyes, and a broken heart. In Matthew chapter 15 verse 3 Jesus says, quote, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? End quote. And in John chapter 14 verse 15 Jesus says, quote, If ye love me, keep my commandments. End quote. We ask you, is Sunday truly the same as Saturday the Sabbath? Are man's self-appointed holidays, Good Friday, Easter, Christmas, etc., the same to God as God's appointed holy days, Passover, Feast of Firstfruits, etc.? Jesus discusses this topic with Judas in John chapter 14, verses 21 through 23. Quote, He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. End quote. Prayfully consider getting in the habit of monitoring what you think, especially what thoughts enter your mind when you listen to certain music, watch certain movies, or play certain games. Examine the following. Person A listens to heavy metal music, watches rated R movies, and plays rated R games. Person B listens to classical or Christian music, watches PG family movies, and plays PG-rated family games. Which person is more likely to have more positive godly thoughts? Which Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 23 defines as the fruit of the Spirit. Quote, Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. End quote. The book of Romans is filled with valuable information on becoming more holy, as does most of the Bible. Romans chapter 6 verse 6 says, quote, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. End quote. John chapter 3 verse 30 says, quote, He, meaning Christ, must increase, but I must decrease. End quote. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 through 24 says, quote, That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. End quote. God's ideal versus what God tolerates. There's a big difference between seeking God's ideal for us versus what he will tolerate. For example, God tolerated and did not condemn Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon, and others for taking multiple wives, but this was not God's ideal. Part of the sanctification process is seeking to follow God's ideal for us, not what he will tolerate or accept. Quote, and he, meaning Solomon, had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. End quote. First Kings chapter 11 verse 3. In this section we learn the following. Number one, what sanctification means. Number two, nominal versus dedicated Christians. Number three, what nominal Christians risk losing in heaven. Number four, what the dedicated Christian can gain in heaven. Number five, the crown's rewards inheritance chart. Number six, 
The Difference Between Salvation Versus Discipleship Number 7. The Parallels Between Christian Medicoy and Christian Torchbearers Number 8. What It Means to Follow Your Calling, Dedication, and Pursuit of Holiness Number 9. The Difference Between Ignorance and Willful Ignorance Number 10. How One Can Do a Right Thing in a Wrong Way Number 11. The Methods to Become More Holy And Number 12. What God's Ideal Is as Compared to What God Tolerates You can start becoming more holy and having stronger faith today. Start with progressively replacing bad habits with good mini-habits. A small example of a new good mini-habit is by reading just one Bible verse each day, but make sure you don't miss your scheduled time. Generally speaking, truth is heard versus seen. Quote, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. End quote. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. To increase your faith, you need to study the Bible. Quote, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. End quote. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Glorification, Step 3. Since loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, might, and mind is the first and greatest commandment and is the ultimate goal, it is crucial that we understand what the term love means before diving into glorification. Please refer to the biblical love chart while going through this section. God's love and our love. People often will use the term love loosely. They will say they love ice cream, love their favorite movie, love a car, or love a hobby. But is that really love? We will deem this sort of love as love type zero. Romantic love or lustful love is the next type, called love type one, which is based upon physical attraction. The next type, love type two, transcends the prior two types of love, which is the type of love close friends or family have for each other. These three forms of love are still conditional based on different factors. Unconditional love, love type 3, is the sort of love a caring parent has for their newborn baby. The baby can neither earn nor lose this unconditional type of love. This is also often spoken of as God-like love. When Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22 verses 37 through 38 that to love God is the first and greatest commandment, what sort of love was he referring to? Was it type 0, type 1, type 2, or type 3? We will let you discover the answer for yourself. Some have narrowly defined love in the Bible based completely upon what Hebrew or Greek word is used within a given manuscript. For example, agapao is stated to be godlike love, philao is stated to be brotherly love, storgi is stated to be family like love, etc. This is not advisable since at times these words are used interchangeably. For example, agapao sometimes refers to brotherly love, and phileo refers to God's love. See example quote agapao the brotherhood. End quote. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 17 and 1 John chapter 2 verse 10, chapter 3 verses 10 and 14, and chapter 4 verse 21. Please see the many other examples and additional details described in the supplemental lecture notes. Because of the mixed usages of these different Greek words, and for many other reasons, it is best to stick with the King James Bible, which was translated by 47 of the world's best translators, and use the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation to better understand and interpret the meaning of the text. Similarities between marriage and our relationship with God. Many essentially clock in and clock out of a brick and mortar church for an hour each week. But if you did the same thing with your spouse, how would they feel? We, the true church, are represented as the spiritual bride of Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the bridegroom. Knowing this, if you were only going to spend one hour a week with a spouse and only focus on them for that one hour, what would your spouse think? Do you think they would feel loved? 
yet many people do this with God. We are called to love God above all else, as stated in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it is said by Lord Jesus Christ to be the greatest commandment. From the Old Testament we read, quote, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. End quote. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. From the New Testament we read, quote, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. End quote. Matthew chapter 22 verses 37 through 38. We are also told, quote, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. End quote. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17 Now that we have an understanding of God's form of love as the ultimate commandment, we will examine some of the verses related to glorification listed in the three stages of salvation chart. In James chapter 1 verse 12 we read, quote, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. End quote. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 we read, quote, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. End quote. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 21 we read, quote, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself? End quote. In 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 we read, quote, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. End quote. In Romans chapter 8 verse 17 we read, quote, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. End quote. In First Peter chapter one verse four we read quote, to inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. End quote. In First Peter chapter five verse four we read quote, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. End quote. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 we read, quote, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. End quote. And in Revelation chapter 3 verse 11 we read, quote, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. End quote. Glorification is the third and final step in the three stages of salvation. The three step process leads us to obtain greater faith, trust, and love of our beloved God. Unfortunately, many people stop at the first step of justification, and as a result will suffer the loss of crowns, rewards, and inheritance. Another problem that can occur is some people try to complete this three-step process out of order, but it must be completed in sequence. Sanctification does not provide justification. Just to review, number one, justification. Acceptance of Jesus equals your separation from the penalty of sin. Result, you become God's diplomat. What's required? 
your faith and acceptance that lord jesus christ paid for your crimes sins against god and repentance of your sins repentance means to wholeheartedly ask god for forgiveness number two sanctification the christian life equals your effort to grow more holy like jesus and separation from the power of sin result you are god's diplomat what's required become more like lord jesus christ in your thoughts and actions and diligently represent and promote god's ways truthfully and accurately as his diplomat you are one of his representatives on earth number three glorification point of death equals you are perfected in jesus in separation from the presence of sin gaining possible inheritance rewards and crowns result you retire to heaven with god after your diplomatic duties what's required justification is required first and then your level of sanctification also known as holiness will determine the level of your glorification in section six we will use the seven golden rules of bible interpretation in order to demonstrate the usefulness of using this stringent method to interpret and understand the bible better in regards to the word wine you don't have to use all the golden rules in sequential order but they all must be applied to the text in question if possible the only rule that should always be considered first is the first rule the rule of inspired text because if you don't have inspired text you don't have scripture and thus you do not have something reliable to work with the first rule rule of inspired text in the previous session we provided evidence that the king james bible was translated by forty-seven of the world's best and most faithful translators who obtained and used the pure hebrew and greek text thus making the king james bible the most qualified to fulfill the first of the seven golden rules of bible interpretation so the authorized king james version cambridge type of nineteen twenty is what we will use here as a reminder when we say cambridge type we are merely referring to the specific publishing company that published the text as we discussed in a previous lecture session the published cambridge version from nineteen twenty to present has no known typeset printing errors the second rule rule of literal interpretation we have no specific verse in question but rather we want to apprehend the best meaning for the word translated as wine and see if we can understand its biblical importance after checking four of the oldest dictionary definitions for wine during the time period in which the pure hebrew and greek texts were translated into english we learned several things number one wine is sometimes spelled w i n v v i n or v i n in old forms of english number two wine can mean a liquid or condensed syrup from fruit or plants that are either fermented or unfermented in other words maple syrup would qualify to be called wine although the meaning of the term wine has largely a different meaning to us today we find the modern dictionary definition for wine includes many of the old uses of the term from dictionary dot com we read quote, the juice fermented or unfermented of various other fruits or plants used as a beverage sauce etc End quote. knowing now that the word wine contains multiple primary meanings we can rightly exclude the ability to use the fourth golden rule the rule of first mention since the rule of first mention will only work if the word or phrase contains only one meaning although it is not necessary and we even advocate against trying to decipher the hebrew and greek manuscripts that still exist today it is an interesting side note that the hebrew and greek words translated as wine can also mean more than one thing for example the hebrew word yayin can be fermented or unfermented wine with or without alcohol the third rule rule of context because the word wine has multiple primary meanings and we are not trying to resolve a word within a single verse or phrase we will combine and resolve the third rule of context the fifth rule of non-contradiction and the seventh rule of single interpretation at the same time 
This process could be completed separately, but in this case there is some overlap in the information we are seeking, and it will be faster to resolve if we handle all three rules simultaneously. To fulfill the third, fifth, and seventh golden rules, we need to review every instance of the word wine in the Bible for two reasons. One, since we know that wine has more than one primary meaning, we need to divide the Bible verses into meaning groups and then determine if a logical pattern emerges. And two, we can obtain a fuller understanding of what wine means and how the term is used. For your convenience, we have done this for you for all 236 matches spanning 216 verses. Please see the document called the Bible Wine Definition Test for the total list. The results of that document have gone into creating the Bible Wine Test Chart depicted here. The following is only the highlights from the document and are in order that the verses appear in the Bible. All verses matching wine, wines, wine bibber, and wine bibbers have been checked. See the Bible Wine Test Chart displayed. Highlights of Bible verses speaking of wine negatively. At first glance, the Bible Wine Test Chart appears to show multiple biblical conflicts, of which two out of many examples are shown in the chart. The first is Proverbs chapter 20 verse 1, where wine and strong drink is labeled in the same verse as a mocker and raging. Yet in Numbers chapter 28 verse 7, strong wine is poured to the Lord for a drink offering in the holy place. If we are speaking of the same liquid, it appears it would violate the fifth rule of non-contradiction to believe that a liquid that is raging in a mocker is acceptable as being a holy, pure offering to God. The second example is Proverbs chapter 23 verse 31, which says to not even look upon wine. Yet in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 23, Paul tells his companion Timothy to not just drink water, but to also drink some wine for his stomach's sake. Some have been taught that all wine in the Bible refers to the same liquid, and if that is true, we definitely have a contradiction. However, the Hebrew and Greek words meant more than one type of liquid. When the Hebrew and Greek words were translated into the word wine in the King James Bible, the word wine also had more than one meaning in English, as we have shown in the old dictionaries earlier, and this knowledge can resolve the conflict. But before trying to resolve this conflict, let us first dive deeper into why one form of wine would be condemned instead of approving all forms of wine. To do this, we will first analyze the top 12 insightful negative verses listed within the Bible Wine Test Chart. 1. Genesis chapter 9 verse 21, quote, And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent, end quote. This verse is included because it is the first mention of wine in the Bible, which happens to be negative, but as mentioned before, the rule of first mention will not work with a word or phrase which has multiple meanings. 2. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 33, quote, Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps, end quote. Although this verse is a metaphor, it is speaking of a time of Israel's disobedience against God and comparing Israel's wine to poison and venom. Also, for those who don't know, the word dragon has the same meaning as the word dinosaur. Sir Richard Owen coined the term dinosauria in 1841, meaning terrible reptile or fearfully great reptile. But prior to that, dinosaurs were commonly known as dragons. 3. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 1, quote, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, end quote. This verse states that wine is a mocker, but also lists it along with a word condemning strong drink. 4. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 31, quote, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, end quote. The prior verse Proverbs 23.30 adds some additional information, quote, 
they that tarry long at the wine they that go to seek mixed wine end quote. as does proverbs twenty three thirty two quote, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder end quote. to tarry is to linger or remain in the vicinity of something so the verse and corresponding nearby verses strongly imply not to remain near wine or even look at it or else it will harm the person proverbs twenty three thirty also speaks of mixed wine as well five proverbs chapter thirty one verse four quote, it is not for kings o lemuel it is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink end quote. proverbs thirty one five the very next verse says quote, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted end quote so this is not a warning that drinking will harm health but rather a warning that the consumption of wine will cause wrong decisions and perverted judgments to be made it seems in every case where wine is spoken of negatively as a result of its use it somehow relates to poor judgment this will be discussed later on six isaiah chapter five verse twenty two quote, woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink end quote. this verse is included in a series of woes which started two verses earlier in isaiah five twenty quote, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter end quote and continuing in isaiah five twenty one quote, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight End quote. this appears to be a strong warning against those who think that they are strong wise or prudent in their own sight and will switch the intended meaning of words to suit their own needs in the same series of statements both wine and strong drink are mentioned seven isaiah chapter twenty eight verse seven quote, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink they are swallowed up of wine they are out of the way through strong drink they err in vision they stumble in judgment end quote in this longer verse it says that some have erred through wine and through strong drink that even priest and prophet have erred through strong drink and wine and also stumbled in judgment the concern always seems to come back to wine strong drink mixed wine etc having a negative effect on the decision-making process eight hosea chapter four verse eleven quote, whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart end quote what is interesting about this verse is that it lumps three things together that take away the heart whoredom wine and new wine new wine is normally associated with juice from freshly pressed grapes but in this case people appear to be drawn away from god and god's ways by things their heart desires nine hosea chapter seven verse five quote, in the day of our king the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine he stretched out his hand with scorners end quote. hosea seven five seems to connect well with the warning previously stated in proverbs thirty one four quote, it is not for kings o lemuel it is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink end quote. ten amos chapter two verse eight quote, and they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar and they drank the wine of the condemned in the house of their god End quote. wine is used as part of a metaphor for how completely they are condemned and fallen in the horrible decisions they have made eleven first timothy chapter three verse three quote, not given to wine no striker not greedy of filthy lucre but patient not a brawler not covetous end quote. all the negative descriptive words include and are preceded by the word not or no which includes the word wine all other negative words mentioned are never indicated as being acceptable to any degree twelve titus chapter one verse seven quote, 
for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of god not self-willed not soon angry not given to wine no striker not given to filthy lucre end quote. the phrase not given to and other verses provide a little more clarity for example the first mention is in genesis thirty eight fourteen quote, she was not given unto him to wife end quote. and a further example is in psalm seventy eight sixty three quote, maidens were not given to marriage end quote. it appears that quote, not given to wine end quote, is similar to saying not receiving wine not taking wine or not accepting wine in this context with these words used it is an all-or-nothing statement you cannot be partially married we have seen strong warnings against consuming being near or even looking upon something which has the potential to affect a person's decision-making ability it sounds similar to the situation in the garden of eden even with such forbidden things having an association with serpents please see the referenced bible verses health concerns are also mentioned in the case of the king who was made quote, sick with bottles of wine end quote. see hosea seven five but this appears to be a secondary concern the primary concern and focus are on maintaining unimpaired mental function in order to make sound decisions and first peter one thirteen seems to confirm this quote, gird up the loins of your mind be sober end quote perhaps an impaired mind would also open a person up to being more readily influenced by fallen supernatural angelic forces as well see first peter chapter five verse eight the chart called one sip disrupts the brain's neurological pathways confirms the primary concern stated in the bible which is the neurological impact on the brain affecting a person's ability to think clearly on the left side of the chart it asks at what point does alcohol start to affect your mental clarity the answer comes from webmd.com quote thirty seconds after your first sip alcohol races into your brain it slows down the chemicals and pathways that your brain cells use to send messages that alters your mood slows your reflexes and throws off your balance you also can't think straight which you may not recall later because you'll struggle to store things in long-term memory end quote. on the right side of the chart it provides a consolidated list of the brain regions impacted by alcohol provided by the national institute of health one the cerebral cortex affects memory thought and more two the parietal lobe affects sensory information and more three the corpus callosum affects communications within the brain four the occipital lobe affects the visual processing center five the cerebellum affects motor control and more six the temporal lobe affects comprehension emotion and more seven the hippocampus region affects short and long spatial memory eight the hypothalamus affects the nervous systems endocrine systems and more nine the thalamus affects the regulation of consciousness and more ten the frontal lobe affects planning motivation and more just like in many other charts shown in this lecture series there is additional useful information contained within this chart which you can download and read in high resolution for free from the page briefing section located on the website www.thetorchbearerseries.com or alternatively there is a link on the home page of the torchbearer series website that will allow you to download all the charts and diagrams in concise single pages called page briefings the chart displayed called alcohol's effects on the body chart confirms the secondary concern stated in the bible which is the health impact on the entire body this chart is not intended to be an exhaustive list but rather to point out some key highlights of concern starting with the brain which we have already covered alcohol interferes with communication pathways which can affect the way the brain works this causes disruptions in mood and behavior 
making it harder to think clearly and move with coordination. The heart. Alcohol can damage the heart, causing problems including cardiomyopathy, stretching and drooping of the heart muscle, arrhythmia, irregular heartbeat, stroke, and high blood pressure. The liver. Alcohol can damage the liver and can lead to various problems and liver inflammations including steatosis, fatty liver, alcoholic hepatitis, fibrosis, and cirrhosis. The pancreas. Alcohol causes the pancreas to produce toxic substances that can eventually lead to pancreatitis, a dangerous inflammation and swelling of the blood vessels in the pancreas that prevents proper digestion. Cancers. Alcohol can cause head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and more. Note, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services lists consumption of alcoholic beverages as a known human carcinogen. The Immune System Alcohol can weaken your immune system, making your body more susceptible to diseases like pneumonia and tuberculosis, as compared to people who do not drink, even up to 24 hours after drinking. According to the National Cancer Institute, quote, a recent study that included data from more than 1,000 alcohol studies and data sources, as well as death and disability records from 195 countries and territories from 1990 to 2016, concluded that the optimal number of drinks to consume per day to minimize the overall risk to health is zero. End quote. The following is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Quote, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? End quote. Please see the linked references within the chart and also within the free downloadable supplemental lecture notes for additional details. As a disclaimer, we are not making any health claims. All health-related information comes from well-referenced sources, such as the National Institute of Health, as the references demonstrate within the charts as well as within the supplemental lecture notes. The fourth rule, rule of first mention. As mentioned earlier, wine has more than one primary meaning, so this rule cannot be applied. The fifth rule, rule of non-contradiction. The fifth rule was handled at the same time with the third rule. The sixth rule, rule of culture. We will go over a chart which should help clarify things from a biblical cultural wine preservation perspective. One of the largest objections to there being wine without alcohol in biblical times is based upon the myth that people long ago could not preserve the extracted liquid from fruits or plants for six months to a year without the aid of alcohol, which is false. This is further demonstrated by the fact that it is in reality more difficult to preserve juice from grapes by creating alcoholic wine than by other methods. Starting from the easiest to hardest, wine as syrup contains no alcohol and is the simplest process. The six-step process is as follows. 1. Sort the grapes. 2. Destem and crush. 3. Collect juice filtering out skins. 4. Boil until a thick syrup remains. 5. Bottle and cork or use beeswax. 6. Store in a cool place like a root cellar. The benefit is that it keeps for one or more years. The boiling process is how maple syrup is made in the United States of America and many other countries. Note, syrup-based wine is reconstituted into drinkable wine by adding water to it. The next easiest method is boiled wine, which contains no alcohol. The seven-step process is as follows. 1. Sort the grapes. 2. De-stem and crush. 3. Collect juice filtering out skins. 4. Boil for approximately 15 minutes. 5. Fumigate the bottle with sulfur gas. 6. Bottle and cork or use beeswax. 7. Store in a cool place like a root cellar. The benefit is that it keeps for one or more years. Fumigating a bottle with sulfur gas by burning sulfur was known and used in biblical times. 
Also, spices could have been added in biblical times to unfermented syrup or boiled wine to make it keep longer and for flavor. The last and hardest method is fermented wine, which contains alcohol. The 19-step process is as follows. 1. Sort the grapes. 2. De-stem and crush. 3. Collect must, which is juice and skins. 4. Add wine yeast. 5. Add nutrients. 6. Add acid. 7. Seal and ferment for weeks. 8. Twice daily allow gas out. 9. Check sugar levels versus the alcohol content. 10. Several more weeks pass. 11. Pour contents into a press. 12. Collect liquid from press. 13. Add oak tannin, which is optional. 14. Let sit for months. 15. Filter liquid several times. 16. Taste test the wine. 17. An additive is added to stop the fermentation process. 18. Bottle and cork or use beeswax. 19. Store in a cool place like a root cellar. The benefit is, is that it keeps for years. At times, spices were added to wine that contained alcohol for flavor, but this did not impact how long it could be stored. According to Cal Wineries Incorporated, a large winery in California, quote, natural yeasts are present on, not in, the skins of grapes, end quote, but, quote, natural yeast is not extremely effective at high sugar levels and can die before the desired alcohol level is reached, end quote, and, quote, an additional potential problem to using natural yeast is that there are often adverse bacteria on the grape skins. In some circumstances, this can be disastrous to the winemaking process. End quote. They also state that quote, natural yeast can be neutralized by adding sulfur dioxide to the juice before fermentation. End quote. Sulfur, biblically known as brimstone, was readily available in biblical times, especially around the area of the Dead Sea where God destroyed several cities with it and is still found in large quantities today. When sulfur burns, it creates sulfur dioxide gas. It has been wrongly believed by some that alcohol needed to be mixed with water because biblical water was unsafe to drink. Yet we find numerous Bible verses that describe water being consumed immediately after retrieving it from a well. Examples include Genesis chapter 21 verse 19, chapter 24 verses 43 and 45, and Proverbs chapter 5 verse 15. Wells worked just as effectively in ancient times to obtain clean drinking water as they work today as long as they are constructed correctly. Just like in modern times, it would be much quicker and simpler to boil water for a short time in order to kill any bad bacteria in it to render it safe for drinking, compared to going through the complex and time-consuming wine-making process. The wine mixed with water purification theory also doesn't hold up when considering it is extremely unlikely that the Jews could have cultivated massive fields of grapes while wandering in the desert for 40 years after their exodus from Egypt. But we don't have to speculate on this though, since the Bible expressly states they did not drink wine for 40 years. See Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 5 through 6. Continuing on to the next point, there is no ordinance in the Torah, the first five books of Moses, that wine with alcohol is to be used in ceremonies. According to Louis Ginsburg, professor of Talmud at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, quote, The sages of Israel never introduced the drinking of wine as a religious custom. They merely gave a religious sanctification to the use of wine which before their times had been drunk in a purely secular way after the fashion of other oriental peoples. It is a general tendency of rabbinic Judaism to give religious sanction to purely secular actions. End quote. He continues, quote, 
by adding a prayer to the drinking of the wine and by reducing the amount used to a single cup the wine drinking ceased to be merely indulgence of the appetite and its use became a religious rite this is the origin of the use of wine in every case where it has become part of jewish ceremonial End quote. professor lewis also quotes rabba stating quote, the juice of the grape is considered wine End quote. End quote. one may press out the juice of grapes and immediately recite the kadush over it End quote. Professor Lewis also states, quote, The custom of using unfermented wine of raisins was widely spread in North Africa in the 14th century with the sanction of R. Isaac B. Charzet Barfet and R. Simeon B. Zama Duran. In our own time, it is prevalent in Lithuania. End quote. A word of caution must be briefly stated after these quotes have been mentioned even if someone of historic notoriety condones a particular action or they commit a particular action this does not mean that it is god's ideal action for example king solomon had many wives and god did not directly condemn his actions which should not be taken to mean that solomon's actions represented god's ideal nor do the actions of many people ministers or rabbis if we are to aspire to follow god's ideal for us then we must take into account god's ultimate holy character and make that our guide during the wedding in cana of galilee would jesus have turned water into wine that contained alcohol approximately fifty-four to sixty gallons worth on top of the wine that had already been consumed by those present which we would also presume included children would jesus have caused children to stumble see matthew chapter eighteen verse six and mark chapter nine verse forty two would jesus have caused family friends and neighbors to stumble with wine Quote, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink that puttest thy bottle to him and makest him drunken also that thou mayest look on their nakedness End quote habakkuk chapter two verse fifteen and also romans chapter fourteen verse twenty one see the additional references and details in the supplemental lecture notes the diluted wine theory which is intoxicating wine mixed with water does not hold up the scrutiny it does not seem reasonable that producing and consuming that volume of even weak intoxicating wine would not have impacted someone who attended the wedding especially since we have already established that one sip starts to affect the brain and body and that any quantity is unsafe for the body per webmd the national institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism which is a division of the national institute of health and the national cancer institute it seems the jews may have picked up the bad habit of drinking fermented wine containing alcohol and yeast during their babylonian exile captivity around four sixty nine to five thirty nine b c which then became part of the oral traditions later collected and written in what is called the mishnah we also know that daniel served in the royal court to the babylonian king nebuchadnezzar during the babylonian exile and would not drink the king's wine Quote, but daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself End quote. daniel chapter one verse eight the term strong wine in the bible does not mean that it always does or does not contain alcohol it seems in most cases if it is spoken of in a positive way then it does not contain alcohol and if it is spoken of in a negative way then it does contain alcohol by viewing wine in the bible in this way there are no conflicts or contradictions that arise and it also does not impugn god's holy character as the one wine theory does pomegranate juice was also used in biblical times and if you ever drank pure pomegranate juice wine you would consider it a strong tasting drink 
which could be what was spoken of in the bible when it speaks of strong wine or strong drink in a positive way in hebrews chapter five verses twelve and fourteen strong meat is mentioned and yet there is no implication that the meat needs to be intoxicating to be considered strong adding spices to any drink or food can make it taste strong but the word strong can imply a deeper meaning just as strong meat does see the supplemental lecture notes for additional details at times warm water was mixed with wine unfermented syrup wine which could foreshadow the sinless blood and water that poured forth from christ on the cross when the centurion plunged the spear into his side piercing his heart the wine and water can also represent the shed blood for the remission of sin and the water baptism into a new life leaven yeast is not to be anywhere within a jewish home for passover and is not to be consumed during passover doing so carried a strong punishment for violating this ordinance during that time period so they would not be consuming a liquid that contains alcohol and yeast see exodus chapter twelve verses nineteen through twenty as a side note for our purposes we will often use the terms leaven and yeast interchangeably please see the supplemental lecture notes for the definitions the yeast fermenting process which creates alcohol puffs up by leaven and spreads and expands it is often spoken of in the bible as representing people who are sinful prideful arrogant carrying false doctrine full of malice and wickedness or unrepentant as another side note in a few cases the use of leavened items must be deciphered to be correctly understood and salt in the bible is often used symbolically as the opposite of yeast a warning against consuming leaven sin in a symbolic sense is that those who do will be quote, cut off from the congregation of israel end quote. see exodus chapter twelve verses fifteen and nineteen and the supplemental lecture notes for additional details in contrast unleavened bread can represent the anointed quote, unleavened wafers anointed with oil end quote. leviticus chapter two verse four holiness quote, unleavened bread shall it be eaten in the holy place End quote. leviticus chapter six verse sixteen having thanksgiving quote, thanksgiving unleavened cakes End quote. leviticus chapter seven verse twelve the number seven quote, seven days ye must eat unleavened bread End quote. leviticus chapter twenty three verse six a nazarite just as jesus was from nazareth Quote, one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them upon the hands of the nazarite End quote. numbers chapter six verse nineteen continuing the passover of the fourteenth to the fifteenth of nisan quote, eat it with unleavened bread End quote. numbers chapter nine verse eleven the feast of unleavened bread quote, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh which is called the passover end quote. luke chapter twenty two verse one and going from an old sinful fermented leaven life to a new believing repentant unleavened sinless life that follows christ first corinthians chapter five verses seven through eight states quote, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for even christ our passover is sacrificed for us therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth End quote. there are at least fifteen bible verses about being sober the following are just three examples titus chapter one verse eight quote, but a lover of hospitality a lover of good men sober just holy temperate End quote. titus chapter two verse twelve quote, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world End quote.
first peter chapter one verse thirteen quote, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of jesus christ end quote we have already shown that one sip of alcohol has a neurological impact on the brain's ability to think clearly which is also consistent with how the word sober is used in the bible as well as how it's defined within old dictionaries sober as defined in detail in old dictionaries abstinent modest to be of sound mind temperate moderate discreet in behavior serious grave modest temperance continuing wise prudent frugal thrifty good wholesome seriousness command of himself modest orderly obedient keeping good company sane in good state of body found of memory well in his wits in his right mind knowing composed undisturbed true sincere earnest staid chaste moderate piety represented as a lady with sober countenance still calm we have at least one documented case of a king james translator george abbott speaking at length of the waldenses and others and he is listed in the churchman volume sixty two as being a puritan having ties back to the first generation torch-bearers who followed christ and the apostles it seems probable that just as george abbott had ties back to the first generation torch-bearers that his fellow translator samuel ward would as well this being the case we might be able to obtain insights into what some of the older torch-bearer groups understood about wine and alcohol samuel ward wrote a book on wine and drinking called woe to drunkards a sermon which was originally published in sixteen twenty two and later a book called a warning piece to all drunkards and health drinkers published in sixteen eighty two which contains a collection of works by samuel ward and many others including the king of england and woe to drunkards a sermon he many times associates wine that contains alcohol with the poison of the serpent the dragon and satan as well as being a gateway to breaking all ten commandments even on the cover of the book woe to drunkards a sermon he uses imagery to show how society previously relied more on biblical truth chivalry and honor as compared to his time which was quickly descending into debauchery and sin it's clear in the book a warning piece to all drunkards and health drinkers that many others during the sixteen hundreds were against drinking even for supposed health reasons the book cover and preface declare quote, his majesty's proclamation against vicious debauched profane persons and drinkers of his health and as to health drinking it is an engine invented by the devil to carry on the sin of drunkenness with the greater ease and infallibility end quote at least one past king of england not only spoke out against health drinkers who claimed to drink alcohol in his honor but he even passed laws against it in a long proclamation by king charles r of england it reads quote, his majesty's proclamation against vicious debauched and profane persons and against drinking his health end quote, who also said that they are quote, a discredit to the nation end quote it is worth taking a look into the modern understanding of wine and alcohol as it relates to how it is perceived depending on how high a person's view is of god's holiness and the moral standards set forth in the bible this is the last part we will cover on wine before the summary the modern understanding most that had a lineage tied to the torchbearers were in favor of banning all alcohol in the united states for example quote, the puritan winthrop when he founded boston in america prohibited healths as a criminal offense end quote. the term healths is in reference to toasting the one's health and then drinking any form of alcohol but this practice had a dark origin which had nothing to do with health the original intent in the first known case to drink to a person's health was that of betrayal 
to secretly destroy the one being toasted and then seal it with a kiss after generations passed this understanding was largely forgotten while the roman catholic and german lutheran communities were in favor of alcohol alcohol was still banned in the entire united states of america from nineteen twenty to nineteen thirty three during the prohibition time period two newspaper examples from the time depict many churches stance against drinking calling it quote, a moral issue end quote some of the christian denominations who took out newspaper ads proclaiming that banning alcohol was a moral issue included but not limited to methodist baptist presbyterian episcopal congregational and evangelical in the united states the stronghold for prohibition was in the south this specific area is sometimes called the bible belt in a large united states of america government investigation called quote, brewing and liquor interests in german and bolshevik propaganda report and hearings of the subcommittee on the judiciary united states senate submitted pursuant to senate resolution three o seven and four thirty nine sixty fifth congress relating to the charges made against the united states brewers association and allied interests in three volumes end quote, totaling four thousand one hundred and twenty eight pages in the year nineteen nineteen we read the following partial summary of their findings which is just prior to prohibition passing Quote, when the alcohol traffic doomed though it is undertakes and seeks by these secret methods to control party nominations party machinery whole political parties and thereby control the government of state and nation it is time the people know the truth the organized liquor traffic of the country is of vicious interest because it has been unpatriotic because it has been pro-german in its sympathies and its conduct around these great brewery organizations owned by rich men almost all of them are of german birth and sympathy end quote. Quote, whereas it has been publicly and repeatedly charged against the united states brewers association and allied brewing companies and interests that there is in the department of justice and in the office of a certain united states district attorney evidence showing that the said united states brewers association brewing companies and allied interests have in recent years made contributions to political campaigns on a scale without precedent in the political history of the country and in violation of the laws of the land end quote. Quote, that in order to control legislation in state and nation they have exacted pledges from candidates to office including congressmen and united states senators before election such pledges being on file that in order to influence public opinion to their ends they have heavily subsidized the public press and stipulated when contracting for advertising space with the newspapers that a certain amount be editorial space the literary material for the space being provided from the brewer's central office in new york end quote. Quote, that in order to suppress expressions of opinion hostile to their trade and political interests they have set in operation an extensive system of boycotting of american manufacturers merchants railroads and other interests that for the furthering of their political enterprises they have erected a political organization to carry out their purposes End quote. Quote, that they were allied to powerful suborganizations among them the german american alliance whose charter was revoked by the unanimous vote of congress the national association of commerce and labor and the manufacturers and dealers associations and that they have their ramifications in other organizations apparently neutral in character end quote. Quote, that they have on file political surveys of states counties and districts tabulating the men and forces for and against them and that they have paid large sums of money to citizens of the united states to advocate their cause and interests including some in the government employ end quote. 
quote, that they have defrauded the federal government by applying to their political corruption funds money which should have gone to the federal treasury in taxes, that they are attempting to build up in the country through the control of such organizations as the United States societies, and by the manipulation of the foreign language press a political influence which can be turned to one or the other party, thus controlling electoral results, end quote. This concludes our partial summary of their findings. Please see the supplemental lecture notes for additional details on this topic. We have previously shown that the Bible makes a strong association between Satan and intoxicating wine. See Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 33, Proverbs chapter 23 verse 32, and Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. We also know that Satan is temporarily, quote, the God of this world, end quote. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. Also see the document called Satan Rules the World Until Lord Jesus Christ Returns, available at www.thetorchbearerseries.com. Knowing these two things, and that historical records inform us that some of the elites who supported World War I and II on the side of Germany were deeply involved in the occult, and were also often anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Jewish in their beliefs, could there be a link between Satan's intentions with a mind-altering substance like alcohol and the 1919 pro-German United States Brewers Association in an attempt to erode and corrupt the morality of Christian-based countries? For those unfamiliar with how truly holy God is, and his desire for us to pursue his holy ways, ask yourself these two multi-part questions. 1. There is a universal consensus that at the very least the Bible condemns drunkenness. Since no one can know what their alcohol consumption limit is until they become drunk the first time, would God have set a standard that no one can follow until they violate it once? No other sins work that way. You don't have to commit some theft or some murder before you realize you committed sin. So why would you have to drink till drunkenness sets in the first time to know if you committed a sin? 2. Alcohol is not a food or a vitamin, and there is no biblical basis for its consumption. So if you had the error on one side or the other, would you rather err on the side of believing God to be more holy and him expecting us to follow his more holy example, or would you rather err on the side of thinking God is less holy and that he consumes cancer-causing alcohol? See Isaiah chapter 28 verse 7 and the previous references. Which stance do you think is more closely associated with Satan? See Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 33. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 32, and Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. The seventh rule, rule of single interpretation, was handled during the third rule, so we will now move on to the summary for section 6. 1. At the time the King James Bible was translated to English, the term wine had multiple meanings. 2. When reviewing every instance of the term wine, wines, and wine-bibber, wine-bibbers, there is without question a conflict unless more than one type of wine is being spoken of. See the Bible Wine Test Chart and corresponding document, the Bible Wine Definition Test. 3. As we have seen in the chart, one sip disrupts the brain's neurological pathways. Any quantity has a neurological impact on the brain, which affects a person's ability to think clearly. 4. We learn that alcohol causes cancer and other harm to the body, and that there is no safe amount per WebMD, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, which is a division of the National Institute of Health, and the National Cancer Institute. Also see the alcohol's effects on the body chart. 5. It is more difficult to preserve juice from grapes by making alcoholic wine as compared to other methods. See the Biblical Wine Preservation Chart. 6. The wine mixed with water purification theory does not hold up to scrutiny. 7. 
There is no ordinance in the Torah that wine with alcohol is to be used in ceremonies, which is also confirmed by Lewis Ginsburg, professor of Talmud. 8. During the wedding in Cana of Galilee, would Jesus have turned water into wine that contained alcohol and got people drunk? The diluted wine theory does not hold up to scrutiny. 9. The Jews may have picked up the bad habit of drinking yeast-fermented alcohol-containing wine during their Babylonian exile, which could be why God's loyal servant, Daniel, would not drink it. 10. Warm water was sometimes mixed with wine, unfermented syrup wine, which could foreshadow the sinless blood and water that poured forth from Jesus on the cross. 11. Leaven, yeast, is not to be anywhere within a Jewish home for Passover, which is also known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven, yeast, is also not to be consumed during Passover, which would include yeast in alcoholic wine. 12. There are at least 15 Bible verses about being sober. 13. At least one King James translator, George Abbott, stated he knew of many torchbearer groups and was himself a Puritan. His fellow translator, Samuel Ward, wrote against drinking alcohol. 14. At least one past king of England not only spoke out against the health drinkers, but also passed laws against them. 15. Most that had a lineage tied to the torchbearers were in favor of banning all alcohol in the United States of America. 16. Many churches were against alcohol and considered it a great moral issue during the Prohibition time period, except for the Roman Catholic and German Lutheran communities who were in favor of alcohol use. 17. The 65th Congress investigated the Brewers Association with criminal charges against them outlined in three large volumes, which included but not limited to, quote, secret methods to control party nominations, party machinery, whole political parties, and thereby control the government of state and nation, end quote. 18. God's holy character and his ideal for us is more in alignment with healthy non-alcoholic wine as compared to Satan's unholy character associated with alcoholic wine. One type of wine contains a blessing, Isaiah chapter 65 verse 8, and the other contains a poison, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 33. Note, for the same reasons alcohol is condemned in the Bible, all mind-altering drug use, whether legal or illegal, are also by implication condemned by the Bible. We now enter our final section, section 7. To understand the amazing end of the bride and bridegroom mystery, we must first understand the fourth commandment, Saturday the Sabbath, since it is one of the keys to unlocking the mystery. The Sabbath. First we must define the Sabbath as the Bible defines it, and then we will continue to utilize the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation in order to understand if the Sabbath is still useful today. Then we will apply what we know to the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery. Remember, the only rule that must be considered first is the first rule. All other rules can be applied in any order or combination together so long as that they are all applied, unless some rules are not applicable, before our final conclusion is accepted. The first rule, Rule of Inspired Text. In previous sessions, we have provided reasonable and probable evidence that the KJV was translated by 47 of the world's best and most faithful translators, who obtained and used the pure Hebrew and Greek text thus making the King James Bible the most qualified to fulfill the first of the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation. The second rule, Rule of Literal Interpretation. The best source for understanding a word in the Bible is to use the Bible itself. We could also attempt to use a dictionary from the King James translator's time period as well, but it should only be used to supplement our understanding of the biblical text. In this case, for the sake of being more thorough, we will search through four dictionaries closer to the King James time period. 
the best definition we obtain is from nathan bailey's new universal english dictionary of words and of arts and sciences where on page five twenty three it defines sabbath as quote, a day appointed by god among the jews and from them established among christians for public worship the seventh day set apart from works of labor to be employed in piety end quote as expected this is a deeply cultural word used by the jews from ancient times since in this case we have no specific verse in question but rather a word and meaning to a word we are trying to apprehend we will be temporarily combining the second and the fourth rule together the first instance of the word sabbath is mentioned in exodus chapter sixteen verse twenty three which reads quote, and he said unto them this is that which the lord hath said to-morrow is the rest of the holy sabbath unto the lord bake that which ye will bake to-day and seethe that ye will seethe and that which remaineth overlay up for you to be kept until the morning End quote. we learn several things from this verse the first thing is it says quote, this is that which the lord hath said End quote meaning god has previously mentioned this before and that it is the quote, rest of the holy sabbath unto the lord end quote. so using the fourth rule it appears at least at this point that the word sabbath means rest and that it is holy and unto the lord therefore the sabbath means rest to the lord and it is holy to the lord but where is it really first mentioned a quick search for the word rest in a digital version of the king james bible results in genesis chapter two verse two which reads quote, and on the seventh day god ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made End quote. the third rule rule of context picking back up from where we left off in genesis chapter two verse two we see that the sabbath appears to be directly related to the seventh day in which god rested to obtain a better context in order to fulfill the third rule let's expand to the nearest adjoining verses for both genesis two two and exodus sixteen twenty three genesis chapter two verse one says quote, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them End quote in genesis chapter two verse three we read quote, and god blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which god created and made End quote. in exodus chapter sixteen verse twenty two we read quote, and it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread two omers for one man and all the rulers of the congregation came and told moses End quote. exodus chapter sixteen verse twenty four quote, and they laid it up till the morning as moses bade and it did not stink neither was there any worm therein End quote from just these six verses we can see a connection between genesis and exodus as it relates to the sabbath in genesis chapter two verses one through three god finished his work within the six days of creation and on the seventh day god ended his work rested from all his work and blessed and sanctified it making it holy in exodus chapter sixteen verses twenty two through twenty four the people god saved worked and on the sixth day they gathered twice as much because god said to-morrow is the rest of the holy sabbath unto the lord our current definition of the sabbath is in six days work is performed and on the seventh day work ends and rest begins this seventh day is also holy and sanctified unto the lord the fourth rule rule of first mention having used the fourth rule during the second rule we will move on to the fifth rule the fifth rule rule of non-contradiction to best utilize the rule of non-contradiction we will need to review every instance of the word sabbath in the bible for two reasons one if we substitute the word sabbath in each verse instance with the current defined meaning 
do the verses still make logical and contextual sense? 2. Can we obtain a fuller understanding of what the Sabbath means and how the term is used? For your convenience, we have done this for you for all 172 matches spanning 147 verses. Please see the document called the Sabbath Definition Test for the complete list. The following is only the highlights from the document and are in the order that the verses appear in the Bible. All verses matching either Sabbath or Sabbaths have been checked. Even though this is only the highlights from 147 verses, we will still need to quickly cover 45 Bible verses, so that you will obtain an expanded understanding of what the Sabbath means. This is also one of the keys to unlocking the entire Bible. 1. Genesis 2.2 2. God implements the seventh day Sabbath observance, but it is not officially named the Sabbath yet. God himself observes the Sabbath and rests from work. 2. Exodus 16.23 The Sabbath is discussed and observed by the Israelites before it is written in the fourth commandment. See also Exodus chapter 15 verses 25 through 26 when it states, quote, Give ear to his, meaning God's, commandments, end quote. And much further back in Genesis chapter 26 verse 5, God says, quote, My commandments, end quote. Question. How long before Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 20, did God give the people the laws, ordinances, and commandments? Answer. They observed the Sabbath before the Mount Sinai stone tablets were given. See Exodus chapter 16 verses 22 through 24. Noah knew what Levitically clean and unclean animals meant before the Levites existed. See Genesis chapter 7 verses 2 through 3. It appears Cain and Abel knew what they should offer to God as a sacrifice before sacrifices were conducted during Moses' time. See Genesis chapter 4 verses 3 through 5. Continuing, 3. Exodus 28. The Sabbath is written into stone as the fourth commandment by God's own finger. Later a second time God writes it again as clarified in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. 4. Exodus 20.10. Israelites, servants, strangers, and cattle within the gates of Israelite territory are to observe and keep the Sabbath holy. Also see Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 14. 5. Exodus 20.11 God reaffirms that he followed the Sabbath during the creation week. By implication, the Israelites could only do as God did if these were seven literal days, for the Israelites cannot rest for a million years. 6. Exodus 31.13 Keeping the Sabbaths is a direct sign between God and man, and that he sanctifies the person. 7. Exodus 31.14 God implements the death penalty for violators of the Sabbath who work on that day, and that a violator's soul is cut off from his people. 8. Exodus 31.16 God's people are to keep the Sabbath holy throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. 9. Leviticus 16.31 The Sabbath is to be kept forever. 10. Leviticus 23.3 The Sabbath is the rest of the Lord. 11. Leviticus 23.24 A series of additional days of rest are beginning to be implemented, but is not the same as the seventh day Sabbath. 12. Leviticus 24.8 Every Sabbath is to be continually observed by the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Keep in mind if you are a Gentile follower of Christ, you are grafted in as a spiritual child of the tree of Israel. Romans chapter 11 verses 13 through 25. 13. Leviticus 25.2 The land given by God is to keep a repeated Sabbath year of rest. This verse appears to be implicated when Lord Jesus Christ physically returns to reign for a thousand years of peace from his temple in the land of Israel. See the end of the Bride and Bridegroom Mystery Chart. 14. Leviticus 25.4 
The seventh year Sabbath is implemented, which is one of the many pointers to the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery that we will discuss soon. 15. Leviticus 26.34 Quote, Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbaths. End quote. Every seventh year the land is to rest and not be farmed. If it is farmed during the Sabbath year, then eventually God's people will have to pay back the Sabbaths that were missed. 16. Deuteronomy 5.12 God reaffirms to keep the Sabbath holy as he commanded. 17. 2 Chronicles 36.21 God's people eventually needed to repay God for the times that they ignored the Sabbath, which in this case meant making the land desolate. 18. Nehemiah 13.17 To profane the Sabbath is evil. 19. Nehemiah 13.18 God's wrath is incurred for profaning the Sabbath. 20. Isaiah 56.2 Blessed is the man for keeping the Sabbath. 21. Isaiah 56, 4 through 6. The benefits for the Gentiles who, quote, taketh hold of my covenant, end quote, and, quote, observe the Sabbath, end quote, and, quote, join themselves to the Lord, to serve him, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, Every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. End quote. 22. Jeremiah 17, 24 through 27. Even a city like Jerusalem will be rewarded for keeping the Sabbath holy, but will be eventually punished and destroyed if they do not. 23. Ezekiel 20, 13. God specifically mentions that polluting the Sabbaths can incur his fury, even upon his people. 24. Ezekiel 22, 26. God specifically warns of not treating all things the same. Quote, they have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. End quote. His holiness, holy days, and holy traditions are not to be considered the same as anything man devises. 25. Ezekiel 46.1 the future temple of God will be shut except for on Sabbaths and new moons. It is open on the seventh day, which is Saturday, not Sunday. 26. Matthew 12, 1. Jesus' disciples pluck and eat corn while they walk on the Sabbath, which the Pharisees protest against in a later verse since they consider it work. But what does God think? Was this profaning the Sabbath? Also see Mark chapter 2, verse 23. 27. Matthew 12, 5. Jesus explains that his disciples' actions were not profaning the Sabbath any more than the Pharisees when the Pharisees do what they also must do for God on the Sabbath. The implication is that since Jesus is God incarnate, and since the disciples were serving God the Son at the time the action took place, there was no violation of God's Sabbath law. Much more could be said on this, but we will continue. 28. Matthew 24, 20 In none of the cases where Jesus mentions the Sabbath does he ever say the fourth commandment is done away with. Instead, he provides clarification on what can and cannot be done. In this verse, he includes, quote, Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, end quote which is in reference to people fleeing on a Sabbath. There were laws against traveling more than a mile on the Sabbath. Shops were to be closed on the Sabbath, and gates shut on the Sabbath. Jesus strongly indicates in this verse that the Sabbath was very much still in full effect. 29. Matthew 28, 1 
Jesus's tomb was found empty and without guards, quote, in the end of the Sabbath, end quote, which is based upon specific cultural day reckoning. This is a complex topic, so we will not endeavor to cover it here, especially since the disciples of Jesus may have described important days according to the day reckoning of the people they were communicating to at the time. Please see the supplemental lecture notes for additional details. 30. Mark 121. Jesus taught on the Sabbath in the synagogue, as other rabbis would have, for it was lawful to do God's will on the Sabbath. 31. Mark 3 4. Jesus asks, quote, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? End quote. It appears that Jesus' point on the Sabbath was to always represent God well while simultaneously observing, honoring, and keeping the Sabbath holy, and not just as another day. 32. Luke 4.16 From Luke's account, we read that it was the custom for Jesus to read in the synagogue on the Sabbath. For something to be a custom, it must be a repeating pattern, so we infer that Jesus did this repeatedly. 33. Luke 6 1. This demonstrates that during this time, there were two observed Sabbaths that took place consecutively. 34. Luke 13 14. The ruler of the synagogue was trying to dictate what days people can seek healing from God, saying they can only seek healing during the six days of work not on the seventh Sabbath day. 35. Luke 13.15 In this verse, Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites for having double standards for how they keep and apply the Sabbath law. They had a lenient standard for themselves and a stringent standard for everyone else. 36. Luke 14.1 Jesus eats a meal with one of the chief Pharisees on the Sabbath. It seems clear that the Sabbath held great importance for the disciples during Jesus' ministry. If this had not been the case, they would not have gone out of their way to repeatedly mention the Sabbath and the law concerning it. 37. Luke 23.54 Preparations are observed for the coming Sabbath. 38. Luke 23.56 they, quote, rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment, end quote, even though Jesus' body needed to be prepared for burial. 39. John 5.16 The Jews persecute Jesus because he healed people on the Sabbath. Jesus was clarifying how to keep the Sabbath holy and how to truly observe the Sabbath according to the fourth commandment, which conflicted with how the Pharisees thought it should be observed. 40. John 5.18 This verse not only shows the importance of the Sabbath, but also that some of the Jews sought to kill Jesus because he said, quote, that God was his Father, making himself equal with God, end quote. 41. Acts 1.12 A Sabbath day journey is mentioned because they, the apostles, followed the Sabbath and people were not to journey over what would be equivalent to a mile in modern times during the Sabbath. 42. Acts 13.14 Paul and people with him attended the synagogue on the Sabbath. 43. Acts 13.27 Reading the Bible is shown to be one of the major Sabbath activities. 44. Acts 18.4 Paul went to speak at the synagogue during every Sabbath. Paul is also speaking to the Gentiles in this verse and is not preaching on the Sabbath to merely appease the Jews. He had every opportunity to integrate away from the Sabbath and preach on the day after for the Gentiles, but did not do so. 45. Colossians 2.16 Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. End quote. This is the last verse in the Bible containing the word Sabbath, and is probably one of the most common verses taken to mean, Do anything thou wilt, but is that true? This is often a confusing topic, so we will touch on it here, and separate things into three categories. One, 
valid ordinances and commandments that still apply today our violation of them has already been paid for by lord jesus christ's death on the cross our diplomatic immunity two limited valid ordinances limited to a specific time period geographic location or specific group three invalid ordinances created by past present or future religious leaders as an example pharisees rome etc that missed the mark as we see in the second category some laws were only to be applied to a specific time period geographic location or a specific group for example procedures for rabbis serving in god's temple this becomes more clear if you read through the 613 laws mentioned in the old testament at least some of these laws will continue to be valid in the future when christ returns to rule for one thousand years see ezekiel chapter 43 verse 18 through chapter 46 verse 24 believers who are not raised jewish are grafted into the olive tree of god's israeli family romans chapter eleven verses seventeen through twenty five non-jewish believers are often initially referred to as gentiles or strangers exodus chapter twenty verse ten and acts chapter eleven verse one these believers through faith become fellow citizens of israel and live within the gates of israel and are part of god's household ephesians chapter two verse nineteen they are expected by god to follow his laws and his ordinances in order to keep their inheritance deuteronomy chapter twenty nine verses nine through thirteen this is not a salvation issue but rather an issue of keeping inheritance and following god's ways out of love for him loving god is his highest commandment for his whole family matthew chapter twenty two verses thirty seven through thirty eight and god says quote, if ye love me keep my commandments end quote. john chapter fourteen verse fifteen in colossians chapter two verse seventeen it says quote, which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ end quote. this statement clearly implies something greater is to come but has not come yet since the apostles were still following these things and looking towards the future many have interpreted these verses to mean let no one judge you if you don't follow the laws and commandments yet in light of the severe persecution of rome against anyone following anything jewish couldn't it mean let no one condemn you for following and observing what god has said concerning meat drink a holy day new moon or sabbath god knew that his followers would be persecuted for following and observing his holy ways and holy days the observance of these things are good romans chapter seven verse twelve first timothy chapter one verse eight etc and will continue to be upon jesus's return including the observance of the sabbath ezekiel chapter forty six verse one these things also concern the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery the sixth rule rule of culture if we check volume eight of dr william smith's dictionary of the bible in nine volumes on pages one thousand sixty four to one thousand seventy four we find ten pages of detailed information on the sabbath we will however only consider this as supplementary information to what we are able to obtain from the bible itself therefore we will postpone covering this rule since it will be covered as part of the section called end of the bride and bridegroom mystery the seventh rule rule of single interpretation this rule has already been applied and how we have applied it has also been checked and validated by others our previous understanding of the word sabbath has held up to this rigorous process and as a result of this process has added some additional details the following is the meaning of the sabbath as defined by the bible during six days work is performed exodus chapter sixteen verse twenty six at the end of the sixth day work stops and on the seventh day physical rest begins exodus chapter sixteen verse twenty six the day is also holy and sanctified unto the lord 
Exodus chapter 16 verse 23 and is not to be considered as any other day ezekiel chapter twenty two verse twenty six the seventh day of the week has always been saturday not sunday sabbath observance was started by god in genesis chapter two verse two the first documented observance by people was in exodus chapter sixteen verse twenty three later god wrote the sabbath law into stone as a permanent fourth commandment reminder for the first time in exodus chapter twenty verse eight lord jesus christ does not deny the sabbath on the contrary he defines and clarifies its observance and condemns the pharisees double standard in regard to the sabbath observance luke chapter thirteen verse fifteen jesus the apostles and the disciples followed the sabbath law both before and after christ's resurrection matthew chapter twenty four verse twenty luke chapter four verse sixteen mark chapter sixteen verse one acts chapter one verse twelve the sabbath will be observed when lord jesus christ returns to reign for one thousand years ezekiel chapter forty six verses one and three there are zero bible verses that say the sabbath or sabbaths have been done away with see the sabbath test chart shown here for details which can also of course be downloaded for free from www.thetorchbearerseries.com just to be clear we are meant to understand god's laws in order to realize how sinful we are and how much we are in need of a savior to take our place for the punishment we deserve we also have god's laws in order to know what righteous targets we are to aim for to become more holy this is what christ demonstrated in perfection and died in our place of imperfection so we could enter heaven god's laws are not to be followed purely out of obligation to god but instead we are meant to aim to follow god's laws and his ways out of our growing love for him knowing we may often miss the mark the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery we can now decode the mystery of the bride and bridegroom by utilizing the information we have learned about the perpetual importance of the sabbath in combination with the jewish wedding customs plus a few other pieces of biblical information for this section we will use two separate documents the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery document and the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery chart we will alternate between the left side of the chart which provides the traditional ancient jewish wedding customs and the right side of the chart which provides information on how jesus as the bridegroom and jesus's followers as the bride is currently being fulfilled and will come to completion in the future this information is available in greater detail within the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery page briefing document the single and double-sided charts and documents are considered page briefings and are available as individual free downloads from the torchbearer series website first phase first line on the chart which is the traditional ancient jewish wedding custom the bride is located in marriage covenant the betrothal is made payment of the purchase price the bride is set apart and a sealed agreement is made on the right side of the chart is the prophetic fulfillment of jesus as the bridegroom and jesus's followers as the bride the bride is located by the holy spirit and the marriage covenant is accepted jesus the bridegroom pays the purchase price on the cross the bride is set apart and a sealed agreement is made as you can see we have a direct one-to-one -one relationship between the traditional ancient jewish wedding custom and the prophetic fulfillment of jesus as the bridegroom and jesus as followers as the bride since the supporting bible verses are displayed within this lecture and shown within two separate corresponding downloadable documents we will focus on the relationship between the traditional ancient jewish wedding customs and the prophetic fulfillment as we work through these seven phases second phase second line on the chart the traditional ancient jewish wedding custom is the bridegroom departs to his father's house and prepares a room addition 
The bride prepares for his imminent surprise return. The prophetic fulfillment is Jesus departs to his father's house and prepares a place, leaving the Holy Spirit while he is away. The bride, which is his loyal followers, prepare for his imminent surprise return. Third phase, third line on the chart. The traditional ancient Jewish wedding custom is the bride ritually cleanses herself physically and spiritually prior to the wedding. The prophetic fulfillment is the bride, Christ's followers, ritually cleanse themselves by physical baptism and spiritually by sanctification, which is focusing on becoming more holy prior to the wedding. The Bible has at least 84 verses on becoming holy. Fourth phase, fourth line on the chart. The traditional ancient Jewish wedding custom is that there is a surprise gathering which commences the wedding. The groom is told by his father when to go, surprise, and get his bride. The groom doesn't know what day or hour since the father determines when things are ready to his satisfaction, which is normally determined when the room addition and other things are ready. The prophetic fulfillment is the groom Jesus is told by his father when to go, surprise, and get his bride, the followers. The groom, Christ, doesn't know the day or hour, since the Father determines when things are ready to his satisfaction. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, it says, quote, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, end quote. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 16 through 17 it says, quote, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, end quote. This event is referred to as the rapture event, which comes from the Latin word meaning to quickly snatch or grab and forcibly take away. Also in the traditional wedding, the bride is provided with a new last name, which directly corresponds to the new name given as a prophetic fulfillment as spoken of in the book of John and the book of Revelation. Fifth phase, fifth line on the chart. The traditional ancient Jewish wedding custom is a seven-day feast for the marriage supper, which in Hebrew also means seven blessings. The prophetic fulfillment is a seven-year time period off of the earth after the rapture, between the bride and groom while the tribulation and the great tribulation occur on earth. The book of Revelation has at least 54 instances where sevens are mentioned. It appears that there will be blessings occurring in heaven while tribulation is occurring on earth. Sixth phase, sixth line on the chart. The traditional ancient Jewish wedding custom is, after the first seven days of marriage, there is a concept known as the first year. During the first year of marriage, the couple, if possible, should never spend a night apart. They should never invite guests for Shabbat, which is another word for the Sabbath day, and a soldier should not go to war. The prophetic fulfillment is that the first year of the symbolic marriage to God actually lasts for 1,000 years. During this time, the followers of Jesus, known as the Bride, will be residing with Jesus, known as the Groom, in the Millennial Kingdom on Earth. They never spend a night apart, during which time there will be no wars. This is the ultimate Sabbath rest of the Lord with his bride. Quote, but, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. End quote. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 8 Just as Adam died within one day, one thousand years, when he ate the forbidden fruit, quote, in all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. End quote. Genesis chapter 5 verse 5. Also see Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. Numbers chapter 14 verse 34. And Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. Seventh phase. Seventh line on the chart. 
The traditional ancient Jewish wedding custom is that the additional restrictions are removed and normal marriage life begins. In the very first marriage, we are told that Eve was created as a helper to Adam and that the two became one, which is elaborated on in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 through 33. This began a new adventure for the couple. The prophetic fulfillment is that when the beginning of the long marriage starts, when heaven and earth are remade, normal marriage life begins, a new adventure. Evidence for the bride and bridegroom mystery permeates throughout the entire Bible. The sixth rule, rule of culture, continued. We have already previously completed this rule as well as the others, but it is worth mentioning that since the information contained within the Bible is very much preferable to external information, there is no need to seek external information. The evidence contained within the Bible itself on the fourth commandment is already conclusive in its perpetual permanence and importance along with all ten commandments as well as the importance in understanding the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery. But we will provide some additional interesting historical information. As previously mentioned, the Waldensian torchbearers also weighed in on the Sabbath. On September 12, 1532, they stated, quote, Does the Bible forbid us to work on Sabbath? Conclusion Men may not engage on that day in any works but those of charity or of edification. End quote. What is often not clear is which Sabbath is being spoken of. Generally speaking, pagan Roman Christians, the Roman reformers who were once part of the religion of Rome, and those influenced by Romanism, adhered to the Roman invented Sunday Sabbath. Whether or not they realize it, the Sunday Sabbath was created for sun god Apollo, as opposed to the torchbearers who never took part in the Roman religious system and maintained Saturday the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, which was observed by God starting in Genesis through to end times in the physical millennial reign of Christ. This is also confirmed in a video interview with Pastor Esteban Janovel who was a Waldensian pastor in northern Italy and a direct descendant of a famous Waldensian, Joshua Janovel. When Pastor Esteban Janovel was asked if the Waldenses followed Saturday the Sabbath prior to their meeting with the Reformers in 1532, he responded, Yes. He said in another interview that after 1532 the Waldenses hid this information since it was an embarrassment that they had moved away from their original teachings handed down from the times of the apostles. There are many books that could be used as a potential starting point for additional in-depth research into the historical accounts of the followers of Christ observing the fourth commandment. As a side note, the day of the Lord also known as the Lord's Day, refers to what Saturday the seventh day is foreshadowing, which is the millennial reign of Christ. God's wrath against his enemies will usher in Christ's millennial reign. The day of the Lord is never spoken of in the Bible as the first day of the week, Sunday. The beginning of the seventh millennium from the creation of the world is the beginning of the day of the Lord. One day equals one thousand years. See the biblical references for additional details. Also remember that the millenniums are not according to our Gentile calendar years, so the year 2000 AD or 3000 AD does not correspond to when Lord Jesus Christ will return and reign for 1000 years. Even though we did not have the time to show the time-consuming process of researching Jewish culture in the Bible, you can see that the results have fulfilled the sixth rule of the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation, which is the rule of culture. This cultural knowledge, in combination with the correct understanding of the Sabbath, has played a key role in the end of the bride and bridegroom mystery as it relates to past, current, and future events. In this third and final lecture session, we have provided clarification to the following seven important subjects. Number one, the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation were presented as well as two examples of how they are used, which thoroughly demonstrate the importance of adhering to the rules. Number two, 
Christian torchbearer doctrines, the basic beliefs were shown with supporting Bible verses backing up each of them. Number 3. Justification. Acceptance of Jesus equals separation from the penalty of sin. Result, you become God's diplomat. Number 4. Sanctification. The Christian life equals effort to grow more holy like Jesus and separation from the power of sin. Result, you are God's diplomat. Number 5. Glorification. Point of death equals you are perfected in Jesus and separated from the presence of sin, gaining possible inheritance, rewards, and crowns. Result, you retire to heaven with God after your diplomatic duties. Number 6. Two Wines. Understanding the Hidden Biblical Importance. There are 18 points we covered concerning wine in the Bible including that the dictionary definition for wine had multiple meanings at the time the translators used it. And if this were not the case, there would have definitely been a conflict with God's holiness, which is the hidden biblical importance. Number 7. The Sabbath. The end of the bride and bridegroom mystery was revealed by using the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation which also demonstrated the importance of the Sabbath as it relates to Lord Jesus Christ's return. Hold fast to the pure foundations of our faith and to the true history and understanding of our torchbearer past. Until next time, we would like to leave you with three charts to ponder plus some additional information. The God Teaches Us chart, the Worldly Jesus versus the Biblical Jesus chart, and the Satan's Counterfeit versus God's Authentic chart. This chart lists 12 reasons why Christians suffer using biblical examples, which also happen to spell out three words from top to bottom, God teaches us. There is of course only one Lord Jesus Christ, and this worldly Jesus versus biblical Jesus chart was designed to get people to think about if they are sliding towards following a false Christ or gravitating towards the real Christ. One of Satan's many titles is the Father of Lies, John chapter 8 verse 44, which extends to creating forgeries and counterfeits for every authentic person, place, or thing of God. The Satan's Counterfeit versus God's Authentic chart was created as a quick reference of just some of the many examples. I strongly encourage you to diligently seek additional information if you are not yet ready to accept that God entered into our physical reality as Lord Jesus Christ in order to die in your place for your crimes and your sins against God. If you are ready to accept his sacrifice on the cross to pay for your crimes, sins, then say the following wholeheartedly out loud. Or you can say it to yourself in your heart if there's other people around. Dear Heavenly Father, I realize that I have broken your laws and have always deserved your punishment. Please forgive me of my crimes against you. I believe and trust that your Son, Lord Jesus Christ, paid for my sins when he died on the cross, and that I have been forgiven and cleansed of every crime I have ever committed against you. I welcome you into my heart and life to mold me into the person you meant for me to become. Please provide for me a new heart and mind that is always focused on your good and righteous ways. For my part, I will seek to know more about you and your ways, and to keep your ways, so I may have stronger faith, trust, and love for you and your ways that continues to grow with time. In the name of your Son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, Amen. It's up to you to decide if what you learned is both reasonable and probable. Your possible next steps can be to download the additional free page briefings and share this information on social media, and or re-upload this information to your own video channels. You can sign up for the free newsletter by going to the website, as well as doing your own research into the Bible using the seven golden rules of Bible interpretation. You can also join us and others every Saturday the Sabbath at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for live group discussions on a variety of topics. Please see the website for additional details. Until next time, 
May God always provide for you an open heart, mind, and spirit to follow him and his ways above our own ways and above the ways of man. All credit, praise, honor, and glory belongs to our beloved God. Amen.